Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Classes of Mail. My name is Alan Gigax, and today we are going to keep reading from the M39. I cannot get enough of this M39. I put it down, I say, okay, that's enough. I got podcasts in the can, I'm, you know... Right now, I'm four podcasts ahead. This will put me five podcasts ahead. That's how enthusiastic I am about reading this M39. And then I start reading it on my own. And then I'm like, no, I got to read this with everybody else because everybody else needs to know this stuff. So let's read it. All right. So we're going to pick up where we left off. We're starting here at section 127. And uh, as a reminder, just a scene setter, the M39 is the management handbook that tells our bosses how they are supposed to do their jobs. By the way, if there's any supervisors out there listening to this, do listen close because uh, obviously you need to know this stuff too. So uh, anyway, we're going to pick up at section 127, office work when carriers return from route. The carrier unit managers must observe and direct carrier activity when carriers return from the route. Observe such things as A. See that carriers promptly clock in on return to office. B. Note any excessive undertime as determined from the posted returning schedule. C. See that clerks are available to check in accountable items as efficiently and promptly as possible. You know, we have a real problem with this at my station, and I bet a lot of your guys' stations do too, where we often don't have an an accountable's clerk to check in our keys at the end of the day just today. I turned in my own keys at the end of the day. There was nobody there to check me in. So if I want to make an issue of it, this is something that I'll cite as a union steward, uh, M39-127C. D, pardon, when carriers have ended their tour of duty, review the carrier work areas for curtailed mail not reported on PS Form 1571. Well, that is definitely something that gets carriers in trouble. Uh, If you bring mail back, you better have a darn good reason, and it better be accounted for on that 1571. I have a whole episode devoted to the 1571 in Season 1. If you have not listened to it, I, of course, I recommend it. E. Complete PS Form 1813, Late Leaving and Returning Report, First Carrier Delivery Trip, and PS Form 3997, or electronic equivalent, from a nationally approved computer system that provides equivalent information. F. Assign work to carriers who are under time. G. Assure that all vehicle repair tags are reported to the vehicle maintenance facility or maintenance contractor as appropriate. H. Review PS Form 3996 Carrier Auxiliary Control as it relates to time authorized and time used. Guys, this is something that gets carriers in trouble. Going into overtime is not what gets carriers in trouble. It's going into unauthorized overtime. So if you put in your 3996 in the morning and you asked for 30 minutes and then you wind up using an hour, well, that extra 30 minutes was unauthorized overtime. It was not on your 3996. You didn't give management the chance to approve it. And that's the kind of stuff that they're looking for here in option H or in uh, item H. So if you realize that you're going to need additional overtime, You have this obligation to report to management and let them know, as you'll essentially amend your 3996. In fact, you'll literally amend your 3996 when you come back into the station. I. Review PS Form 4570 Vehicle Time Record or PSDS Report Number 4 Vehicle Utilization and the Tachograph Chart where used to assure that mileage travel does not exceed authorized mileage for the route. In this connection, 1. Compare actual daily mileage driven to the authorized mileage shown on current PS Form 3999 and PS Form 3999B. 2. Where unreasonable deviations are found, determine causes and take necessary corrective action. Funny story about that. Uh, Back in the day when people still got Netflix DVDs, there was a carrier at my station who got busted for stealing Netflix DVDs. And... One of the ways that management got wise to him was he was putting extra miles on his truck every day because he was stealing the Netflix DVDs out of the DPS in the morning and then running it to his house while he was out on his route. So he would go like, you know, four miles out of his way or whatever to go drop these DVDs and then go back on his route thinking that no one would be the wiser. But 
when uh, when some investigating was done, it was determined that he was stealing Netflix DVDs, and that dude got arrested. And I don't remember. I don't know how it all worked out. I wasn't on the inside back then. Hell, I'm still not on the inside. But that is something that management is supposed to do. All right, Jay. Make sure all carriers have returned their data collection devices to the appropriate cradles and information has been downloaded. Moving on to 128, Operations Analysis. 128.1, Preparing PS Form 3930. Delivery unit managers or designees must prepare PS Form 3930, Operations Analysis. 128.2, Source Documents for PS Form 3930. 128.21, Two of the source documents for the accurate completion and analysis of PS Form 3930 are the edit book and or PS Form 1621. Oh, two of the items are the edit book and or PS Form 1621. Okay. It is mandatory that delivery unit managers strictly supervise the completion of these documents to ensure accuracy. Refer to the three previous accounting periods covering new deliveries added or deducted from route to be sure entries have not been duplicated. Unless the recording of the total possible deliveries is accurate and kept accurate throughout each accounting period, the integrity of the information on the PS Form 3930 operations analysis is seriously impaired. You know, to that end, we actually had people from AMS, the address management system, in my station today. And they were going around talking to everybody about the Red Books, offering advice on how to make changes if you need to make changes, helping people fix things. And that's a good service. I think they should do that, you know, on the regular. Make sure people understand how to do their edit books. And you may remember on a previous episode where we talked about the class uh, carrier or the case labels, C-L-A-S-S. And I said, well, obviously it stands for, the C-L is for case label, but what's the A-S-S? And uh, I asked them about it and I showed them where it is in the M39 and the two people there from AMS had no idea they'd never even heard of it. So it may be something that's in the M39 that is like seriously outdated, which would not surprise me because so much of this stuff is like super outdated. All right, moving on. 128.22. To assist in the accuracy of the edit book and or PS form 1621, a definition of a possible delivery is a physical location on the letter carrier's route where mail may be delivered. Although more than one family or business receives mail in a single receptacle or at a designated mail receiving point for bulk delivery, such as to the management of trailer courts, hotels, motels, etc., this does not change the definition of possible deliveries. Accordingly, one possible delivery would be recorded under such conditions. Any vacant residences, stores, or offices, as well as those that receive mail through post office boxes, are to be considered as possible deliveries. When more than one trip is scheduled to a route, possible deliveries are the total number of times the location is served daily. New construction or restored structures are recorded as possible deliveries when the carrier begins delivery. Dwellings Dwellings or business places vacated or condemned in areas undergoing demolition or renewal are deducted as possible deliveries. 128.23. The delivery unit manager must check the edit book and or PS form 1621 in the carrier's route book several times each accounting period. Such items as urban renewal, new apartment houses, or new construction of any kind must be reported as early as possible by the carrier, which will permit the manager to visit the area and assist the builders in preparing for the approved and desired method of mail delivery. In addition, the unit manager must maintain close contact with state or local governments regarding future planning and building permits. 128.24. The properly prepared edit book and or PS form 1621 will indicate where a need for future adjustments may exist and allow the unit manager to plan for them and also provide a source for the delivery point sequence sort plan information. Next we have a couple of uh, exhibits here that show what uh, form 3930 looks like and what uh, PS form 1621 delivery management report looks like with all the information filled in. So if you want to see those, check out pages 37 and 38. All right. Next, uh, 128.3, analyzing and using PS Form 3930. 
The analysis of PS Form 3930 provides an accurate system of measuring the efficiency of carrier operations, special delivery messenger operations, and other customer service activities at all delivery units. It enables management to immediately detect and correct conditions causing adverse cost trends. 128.32. Two major factors that influence carrier operating costs are A. Incoming mail volume and B. Possible deliveries. 128.33. Other factors such as weather conditions, terrain, excessive sick leave, personnel turnover, etc. also influence carrier operating costs. Oh boy. All right. So 128.33. These are the things that influence operating costs. Excessive sick leave is listed. And if your station is anything like mine, management is really good about trying to crack down on excessive sick leave and issuing letters of warning and 14 day suspensions for attendance and refusing to settle and, and all kinds of stuff. They really crack down on that, that factor excessive sick leave. But the one right after that, personnel turnover, what steps is management taking to try to reduce that cost? Um, it's certainly not be civil towards CCAs and, you know, try to give them reasonable hours and stuff like that. The turnover, I mean, at my station, it's well over 50% each year, the, you know, the CCAs that we lose. It's probably gotten a lot higher than that. And we're not a particularly abusive station. It's it's amazing to me the way this post office operates, the way the post office in general operates, and how this job that is supposed to be this long-term, stable source of employment for the middle class can't keep more than half of its employees in the first year. Like, what is going on? And, and how does management not see fit to address it? It's... It's ridiculous. All right, so moving on, 128.34. It is imperative that the carrier unit manager record any unusual conditions on the PS Form 3930. 128.4, barcode or similar data systems and related software slash hardware. A, local management has the responsibility to install, maintain, and update the quality of equipment and labels or buttons required for the gathering of information related to barcode or similar data collection systems. Guys, if you're having problems with your scanners, if they're breaking down, if management isn't getting new batteries for you, here's your citation, 128.4A. This is where the responsibility is put squarely on them that they're supposed to be keeping this stuff in good working order and maintaining it and updating the quality and so on. I mean, of course it's on management. Who else would do it? It's not like I can go out there and buy a scanner. Management has to do that. And if they're not doing it, we should be holding them accountable. This is the kind of stuff that I want to file grievances for at my station, but uh, I'm only an appointed steward and I could be unappointed at any time. And my local union president has said he doesn't want me wasting time doing stuff like that. Not that I'm particularly busy as a union steward at the moment. Our station runs pretty smoothly, but that's, that's its own separate issue. All right, uh, 128.4B, generation of reports and transferring data from scanning devices to PC hardware will be accomplished in a reasonable and timely manner. C, local management has the responsibility to review and analyze daily reports generated through such systems to ensure compliance with 132.3. And next we move on to the next topic, analyzing operations. 131. Carrier Operations, 131.1 Timing of Analysis. At regular intervals and three or four weeks prior to route inspection, make the analyses listed in 131.2. 131.2 Types of Analyses. 131.21 Late Leaving and Returning. 131.211 Source of Information. Obtain this information from PS Form 1813 or PSDS Printout. 131.212 Preparing the Analysis Form. It looks like this has a bunch of instructions for how you actually fill out the form. I think I'm going to skip that. Uh, we'll skip down to 131.213, Analyzing PS Form 1813. Uh, there we go. Determine whether one or more carriers frequently left late. If so, there is indication that A. Routes may not be adjusted properly. 
B. The starting or leaving time may be improper. C. There is a pattern in late leaving on the same day. D. There may be heavy volume days where a pattern of late leaving is prevalent. Possible solution? Provide for possible schedule changes, staggering of mail flow, curtailment of mail, or auxiliary assistance within the office. E. Possible inefficiency exists. At my station, we have a problem with late leaving, and it's because we're waiting for parcels. And here are some solutions right in here, aside from changing the start time, like auxiliary assistance within the office. In the job description for City Carrier Assistant, I think it's item 12, says that they will have to do clerk work as needed, or I forget the exact wording. Uh, but, you know, having them do things like come in and help throw parcels, to me that seems reasonable. They're going to come in, we start at 8 o'clock, they usually come in at 9.30 after the mail is all up and ready to go, and they just take it directly to the street for auxiliary assistance. Why not have them also come in at 8 and have all hands on deck and they're throwing parcels to get it all ready for us? I don't know. There must be a good reason because management doesn't do it. All right, moving on. Uh, 131.22, auxiliary assistance and or overtime given to route. 131.221, source of information. Obtain this information from PS Forms 3996 and or PSDS printout. 131.222, preparing the analysis. CPS Form 1627, uh, complete as follows. Oh, and here's, again, our instructions about how to fill out this form. 131.223, analyzing the form. When overtime or auxiliary time is frequently used on a route, determine whether A, the route is properly adjusted, B, the office time is consistent with mail volume, or C, the carrier is performing duties efficiently. And now on page 41, there's a chart that shows this form 1627 all filled out. Next, 131.23, hours used on auxiliary route. 131.231, source of information. Obtain this information on P, uh, from PS Form 3997 or electronic equivalent from a nationally approved computer system that provides equivalent information. 131.232, preparing the analysis. CPS Form 6... Oh, again, these are just instructions for how to fill out the form. All right. 131.233, analyzing the form. Compare hours used with authorized hours to determine whether excessive hours are being used. If hours appear excessive, take into consideration additional deliveries due to new construction or added territory. B. Determine cause for excessive hours used and take appropriate action as needed. And here is another chart that has uh, the analysis of auxiliary routes. It's on page 43 if you want to look at it, what that form looks like. 131.24, oh, now, that, now this gets interesting, evaluating employees. 131.241, prepare PS Form 1627, similar to uh, what was seen above, for all new and other employees not assigned to a regular route whose efficiency is not satisfactory. Prepare separate form for each of these employees. 131.242, record the date, the route number, the absence hours, and the hours the employee used against the absence, and indicate the days the employee left after scheduled leaving time. 131.243, additional columns may be used to record office and street time to measure improvement. When satisfied that the employee is performing satisfactorily, the record may be discontinued. I like this because this is for new and other employees not assigned to a regular route. So like CCAs would fall under this umbrella. And we have these closing supervisors who just tell CCAs that they're not going fast enough. And if you don't go faster, you're going to be in trouble. So what's the problem? You know, management isn't actually giving them advice on how they should improve on what they need to be doing differently. What are their time-wasting practices? Because they're just sitting behind a desk and criticizing. They don't know what's going on. So for me, going forward, if I'm going to try to defend one of these CCAs, I'm going to ask management for their Form 1627 to see how they've been monitoring these employees and checking to see if their performance is improving and whether it's satisfactory. Because if they're not doing that, then they're just criticizing without a basis. It shows, it says right in their own manual how they're supposed to evaluate their employees. 
uh, specifically employees who are not assigned to a regular route. And if they're not doing that, then that's on them, not on the CCA. All right, so that's uh, 131.24. 131.25, mail curtailed. 131.251, source of information. Obtain this information from PS Form 1571. And preparing the analysis form, we'll go ahead and skip that, how to fill the form in. 131.253, analyzing the form. A, if mail is seldom curtailed, review the an analysis of late leaving and PS Form 3922, Daily Customer Services Unit Volume Recording Worksheet for the same period to determine whether carriers are permitted to clean up rather than curtail within time limits to the next day. Also, review the analysis of auxiliary and overtime for the same period to determine the amount of auxiliary assistance and overtime used. B. Determine whether carriers are authorized to curtail mail on heavy days. C. If, if curtailments are frequent, the office time schedule may be incorrect. D. Frequent curtailment may be due to incoming mail not being worked as early as possible. A revision of the clerk schedules may be the solution. Delivery managers are responsible for bringing variation of mail volumes to the attention of operation managers. E. Watch for patterns in curtailment, such as certain days of the week, day before or after scheduled non-work days. If curtailments are necessary on Tuesdays, current distribution is probably not being maintained on the weekends. So I know there are still places around the country where mail is being curtailed like crazy, where whole routes just aren't going out. And in my opinion, it's really important to fill out these 1571s anytime that mail doesn't go out, because we need that paper trail to show that management is not meeting their responsibilities. You know, it says here what they should do if this mail is being curtailed. They need to bring the clerks in earlier. They need to make sure that they're using proper auxiliary assistance and overtime, things like that. That's their job. So, you know, our job, show up, deliver the mail, do a conscientious job, a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. But it's their job to make sure all this crap gets done. And that 1571 provides that paper trail when management's not doing what they're supposed to do. All right, on the next page, there's another uh, Form 1627 filled out. Oh, this is the one, the evaluation of performance. So uh, there you go. This is what you would ask for if management is claiming that uh, carriers aren't performing uh, as, you know, like going as fast as, you, as they would like. All right, moving on to 132, review of collection services. 131 or 132.1, policy. Collection service is an integral part, collection service is an integral part and highly visible function of the processing and delivery system and must be geared to the needs of the mailing public and at least must meet national minimum collection standards as published in Chapter 3, Postal Operations Manual. Effective and efficient service can be achieved through proper scheduling of service and day-to-day -day management of operation. All right, so here in Las Vegas, we have a separate collections department. And these are people who just pick up from those blue boxes and they pick up from big businesses that do a lot of mailing and stuff like that. So if I were a steward in the collections department, like the dude who sat next to me at the last union meeting, uh, I would be reading chapter three of the postal operations manual because that obviously details uh, what goes on in the collections department and how collections are supposed to be handled. So, yeah, if I had that specialized job, that would be of great importance to me. And absolutely, I would go and read that. 132.2, considerations. 132.21, motorized city carriers should collect mail from boxes as they return to the office with consideration to overall fuel consumption and travel time rather than earlier in the day, thus affording customers more deposit time. This could also result in a reduction of mileage by evening collection runs while continuing to provide adequate collection service. In addition to collection boxes, carriers must collect prepaid mail adjacent to, in, or on mail receptacles when delivery is made to that particular delivery point. Motorized, char motorized carriers must collect from curbside boxes on their route. Uh, they must collect from curbside boxes on their routes, mail with postage affixed if the signal flag is raised. All right, so this is also discussed in the M41, and it's something that I highlighted in my M41 episode. If you are on 
a walking route, if you're doing park and loop or a foot route, if you don't have mail for that house, you can skip it. Apparently, even if their flag is up and they're signaling to you that they have outgoing mail, the only people who have to stop for that flag being up is curbside delivery, uh, where it specifically says that if the flag is raised, you have to stop and collect that outgoing mail, even if you don't have mail for them. Now, me personally, if I see that one of my customers, I'm on a parking loop route, if one of my customers has outgoing mail, absolutely, I'm going to go up and collect that mail. But knowing the rules will tell you that, no, you don't have to. If you don't have mail for them, you can just keep on trucking. 132.22. Collectors must report heavy volumes of mail deposited in boxes by business mailers. Businessmen can be contacted to bring their mail earlier in the day. I like this. That has not been revised. It just says businessmen. Businesswomen, you can go lump it. You are not included. Yeah, I presume at some point that will be revised to say like business people. But for now, yeah, still says businessmen. Uh, 132.23. Business collection trips must be scheduled to conform to availability of mail. If volume warrants, an additional box may be placed beside the original box to avoid customers leaving mail outside a filled box. 132.24. Mail chute receiving boxes and cooperative mailing racks in the lobbies of office buildings may be collected by foot collectors in the downtown area using small folding nose hand trucks, item 1071. This mail should be shuttled to the distribution unit by motorized collectors. 132.25. Station-based collection routes may be established, and mail from several routes can be shuttled to the mail distribution unit. 132.26. Larger residential carrier stations having sufficient vehicles and adequate platform space may make collections in their own territory, as well as in the territory of several adjoining stations. 132.27. Parcel post delivery routes may be arranged to provide regular assignments consisting of parcel deliveries and collections. This will eliminate some of the problems regarding manpower available to make evening collections. 132.28. In VIM mail rooms, I don't know what VIM stands for, uh, mail may be collected from bundled mail drops where provided. 132.29. The local or the proper pre- the proper separation of local out-of-town, metered, and stamp mail, etc. must be maintained when collecting from boxes providing different levels of service. 132.3 Barcode and similar data collection devices. Devices used to gather time of pickup and collection point location will be assigned to carriers in the course of their duties to A. Review the quality of collection services. B. Improve mail flow to the processing facility. C. Evaluate travel patterns. D. Assure that collections are made in accordance with existing service guidelines. These devices have the capacity to assist in gathering information for review and daily analysis listed in 133.1. 132.31. Barcode or similar data collection devices, computer and software programs used as described in 132.3 must be approved by the Office of Delivery Policies and Programs and conform to procedures outlined in this handbook. Now moving on to 133 collection service. 133.1 is a checklist. The following review made quarterly or more often than needed will reduce delay of mail. (laughs) I know this is happening around the country with the consolidation of some of these sorting and distribution centers Um, in Georgia. It's been in the news lately that their mail is being delayed pretty heavily by this issue. So maybe whoever's in charge down there should be going through this 133.1 checklist. A, are existing schedules realistic? No, apparently they're not. B, has a manager checked a proposed schedule for safety, spread of time, traffic conditions, changeable one-way streets, etc. before initiating the collection trip on a permanent basis? C, Have collection routes been scheduled to arrive at the distribution unit at staggered times and are schedules being maintained? D. Is assistance necessary for collectors at the dock to help unload in the quickest time and safest way possible? Does the collector have to take the mail some distance into the building? E. Does each collection schedule also contain an up-to-date map of the area to be covered with the location of boxes shown? F. 
Is there a check on the arrival of the collectors at the distribution unit? G. Are collectors required to report on PS Form 3968 Daily Mail Collection re Record reason for late arrival at the distribution unit, and is this report reviewed by a manager with intent to correct late returning? H. Are pickups of heavy volume business mailers arriving at the distribution unit as early in the day as possible? I. Is MV, MVS, I presume that's Motor Vehicle Services, being used to extent possible to bring in collection mail in conjunction with regularly scheduled motor vehicle runs? J. Are boxes properly located and accessible to the public? K. Are boxes anchored and are boxes and the schedule labels and cards kept in good condition? So here's another one, I'll, I'll digress. If you're having problems with your collection boxes being in poor repair, this would be something that you would cite. It would be 133.1K, that the boxes should be anchored in good repair and so, and so on. L, do the boxes bear the proper decals, color schemes, and do the labels or cards show time mail is collected as well as the nearest later box collection uh, the the nearest later box collection location. So like, oh, if you miss this deadline, here's another one down the street. M, is street supervision being co conducted on the collection service? All right, so that is collections. M, 133.2, tests. Um, okay, I guess there's testing of the collection service, so let's see what that's about. 133.21, purpose. Collection service tests should determine whether mail is being collected as scheduled. Testing includes letter routes and all types of routes performing collections. So I guess this wouldn't refer just to the collection department because even as regular letter carriers, we also collect mail. 133.22, frequency. 133.221, quarterly collection test requirements will be administered as follows. A. City delivery locations where all collection points are routinely scanned every day may, at manager's option, at management's option, suspend all manual collection test procedures as long as the daily scanning of these points continues. The daily scanner history detail report will serve as supporting documentation in place of the manual tests. All right, so this is good. At the collection boxes that we service out of my station, there's a barcode inside. And when we pick up from that collection box, we have to scan that barcode. So it sounds here like as long as you're scanning those barcodes, then you don't have to worry about your collection point being tested. B. City delivery locations where all collection points are not routinely scanned every day must continue to collect or conduct the quarterly collection tests as outlined in 133.222 through 133.282. All right. So with that in mind, I am actually going to skip through the way these collection tests are supposed to be conducted. If you happen to have a collections route and you're not using the barcodes, feel free to come and read these yourself. It starts on page 48 and goes down to, uh, let's see, goes down to page uh, 50. All right, and then we're going to pick up page 50. Ah, now we get into more generally applicable stuff. This is going to, all right, it's going to get lively again. 134, street management. 134.1, objectives. 134.11, street management is a natural extension of office management. All carriers are to be notified to expect daily supervision on the street just as they receive daily supervision in the office. For a delivery manager to fully understand and control the organization, the manager must be aware of any conditions that affect delivery anywhere within the service territory. So this is perfectly reasonable. Management should come out and check up on you out on the street and make sure you're doing the right things. And I know carriers complain about that, but that really is a reasonable thing for management to do. And it's part of the reason that I stress on this podcast that you need to be doing the right things out there so that you don't have to work in fear of what if management comes out? What if they actually do these things they're supposed to do in Section 134 and they really do street management? Great. If they come out and do street management on you, then they'll know that you're actually doing the right things and it's not worth it to try to mess with you. All right, 134.12. Accompanying carriers on the street is considered an essential responsibility of management and one of the manager's most important duties. Managers should act promptly to correct improper conditions. A positive attitude must be maintained by the manager at all times. Dude, so this... 
a proper attitude must be maintained by the manager at all times. This is absolutely the kind of thing that you're going to cite in a joint statement grievance where you're going to talk about management's uh, harassment and belittling carriers and berating people and stuff like that. This one specifically speaks to when they're out there on the street with you. So this 100% belongs in a grievance where management may confront you out on the street and take issue with what you're doing and just act a fool. 134.13, conservation of energy is most important, and street supervision must also be directed to achieve this objective. Supervisors must not permit authorized or must not permit unauthorized deviations from the route, engine idling for excessive periods, wasteful driving habits, and unauthorized or excessive vehicle stops and moves on park and loop routes. I know this still happens at my station, even though I've talked about it at multiple stand-up talks, where carriers will try to deliver park and loop routes as though they're over the curb or sidewalk delivery. So they'll drive the truck up to the house, they'll get out of the truck, run up to the door, run back to the truck, drive to the next house, get out of the truck, run up to the door, run back to the truck, drive up to the next house. And these are just normal residential neighborhoods that are supposed to be park and loop and there's no way number one there's no way this is faster than delivering it like a normal park and loop unless you're cutting a bunch of corners you know maybe if you don't secure the vehicle every time and don't grab your satchel and all these things that you're supposed to do on park and loop maybe it's faster but you're taking a lot of risk and, you know, I've had a whole episode about like doing the job the right way. And that's the kind of thing that's covered in there. And here it specifically says that management is supposed to look for those things when they're out doing street observation. All right. 134.2 techniques. 134.21. The manager must maintain an objective attitude in conducting street supervision and discharge this duty in an open and above board manner. I know you've heard Corey Walton talk about this many times on ADA arbitration an open and above board manner. And then 134.22, the manager is not to spy or use other covert techniques. Any employee infractions are to be handled in accordance with this section in the current national agreement that deal with these problems. There it is, guys. They can't be spying on you. If they come out to observe you, they have to let you know that they're observing you and do everything in an open and above board manner. So if I have a carrier who gets in trouble for something that they did, they did out on the street, part of my investigation when I'm filing the grievance is going to look at 134.2 and see did they use proper techniques when they saw this carrier doing what they allege the carrier did. 134.3, criteria for need. Certain criteria may call attention for individual street supervision. When overtime or auxiliary assistance is used frequently on a route, foot, motorized, parcel post, collection, relay, when a manager receives substantial evidence of loitering or other actions or lack of action by one or more employees, or when it is considered to be in the interest of the service, the manager may accompany the carrier on the street to determine the cause or meet the carrier on the route and continue until such time as the manager is satisfied. No advance notice to the carrier is required. Guys, what we've just read here is important. I'm reading it for the first time right with you. And it is a hot topic now. Corey's talked about it on aid arbitration, stationary events, or I forget what, what else, idling time, or there was some other phrase that management's using in addition to stationary events, a loitering time. So it says right in here that this may call for individual street supervision, that when they have evidence of such actions, then they should accompany the carrier and see what's actually going on. That's what they do. They come out and they check. They don't just bring you into the office and attempt to issue discipline. It says right in here, 134.3, the way they're supposed to handle this data. And they use that data to say, oh, there may be a problem out here. We should go out there and see what's going on. They don't just take the data at face value and then accuse you of doing something wrong. That is not okay. It is spelled out in 134.3. And any steward out there needs to be on the ball with using this in defending these carriers. 134.4, findings. 
134.41. The manager may find A. Routes are not in proper adjustment, and the frequent use or request for auxiliary assistance or overtime is warranted. B. A change in the line of travel could reduce travel to and from the route, deadheading on the route, or time-wasting delivery patterns. C. The carrier is not performing duties efficiently or safely with regard to 1. Vehicle movement on park and loop routes. 2. Proper use of relays. 3. Fingering mail while driving or when walking up and down steps or curbs or when crossing the street. 4. Following the prescribed line of travel. 5. Protection of all mail. 6. Unauthorized or extended stops. 7. Deviating from the route. 134.42. The manager must note areas of new construction, plan for expansion, and be aware of urban renewal areas, changing traffic patterns, the need to relocate collection boxes, customer problems of delivery, etc. 134.43. The manager must inspect for mail trap behind wall-mounted or wall-recessed apartment house mailbox units. When, where mail is found, request apartment house management to initiate prompt corrective action to preclude recurrence. 134.44. The manager must periodically test mail locks on letterboxes and USPS approved receptacles <clears throat> installed with arrow locks as follows. A. A special key for testing arrow or inside locks is available from the mail equipment shops by requisition on PS Form 4983, postal key and lock requisition. Smaller offices need only one key. Larger offices should not require more than 25 or 30 keys. The keys bear a numerical number beginning with key number one. Oh, a numerical number. Those are the best kind of numbers. <clears throat> Do not confuse these numbers with the combination number appearing on the back of locks and on regular arrow keys. B. The test key shall be used as follows. With the lock in the lock... Eh, we don't have to go over the directions for how to actually test locks out there. I'll leave that for management to read. If you're interested in it, you can find it on page 52. All right, 134.5, safety. During any period of street supervision, every opportunity must be taken to emphasize safety while driving, walking on sidewalks, walking up and down steps, crossing streets, collecting mail, or delivering relays or parcels. And thus ends section 13. Up next will be section 14 adjustments, and I'm going to save that for next time. This talks about um, making route adjustments, and it looks like the way management is supposed to do that, what constitutes a minor adjustment. So look forward to that in an upcoming episode. And also, if you've listened all the way to here, here is a teaser. My Carrier Academy case resolved. And I got a call yesterday from the director of training here in Las Vegas telling me that he's putting me back on the schedule and that I will be teaching again in the Carrier Academy. <clears throat> so with this resolution, I can finally tell my story. I'm still waiting on some uh, paperwork from National where it settled out from the director, the office of the director of city delivery. And once I get that, it will be time to finally tell the story. So... That'll be sometime in the hopefully the very near future. And uh, thanks for listening, guys. I will catch you next time.